now you, you've done a lot of research um, but it's around the topic of going to and the importance of going to momentary muscular failure that's correct do you see um, any potential value in going beyond a, a very simple um, single set to momentary muscular failure module do, do you see a need at any point for anything beyond that is there any evidence in fact for anything else I think that I think this is the, the key question that's coming up in the literature right now and it's certainly the key question that I'm trying to answer um, we've looked at a lot of advanced techniques in, in the use of pre-exhaustion where you uh, proceed a compound exercise with an isolated exercise to pre-exhaust the, the, you know, the primary muscles, the primary target muscles. Um, and of course, breakdown sets, so performing an exercise to fatigue and then reducing the weight and forming it to fatigue again, or negative rep repetitions or assisted repetitions. So there's a lot that can be done to, to make a greater inroad and recruit a higher number of muscle fibers. Um, the goal, obviously, in resistance training is to recruit as many muscle fibers as possible to catalyze a stimulus to recover by becoming stronger or increasing in cross-sectional area or both. Um, the greater the inroad that you'll make, the greater the, the challenge that you'll put on that person probably with regards to the length of recovery required. So whilst there might be a potential greater increase in strength, from some of these advanced techniques, although the evidence doesn't seem to support that at the moment, um, it might mean that they have to reduce their training frequency even further, or even reduce their training volume from five or six exercises down to two, three or four exercises. What we should also consider with this in mind is not just the physiological context, but the psychological context. I think a lot of people who do resistance training and are, are experienced trainers like the psychological stimulus of doing different techniques of doing negative repetitions, of having assisted repetitions by their training partner or their personal trainer, um, of doing pre-exhaustion because it's a different stimulus. Um, and again, we could start to look into whether there is a need to constantly change the stimulus for the body to make adaptations to it, or whether simply reaching momentary muscular failure is enough of a stimulus to catalyze an adaptation, which at the moment the evidence seems to suggest that Training to momentary muscular failure recruits all, avail all available muscle fibers to respond, and that seems to be sufficient. The interesting part about that is uh, you had um, the one of the pieces of research you've done recently compares rep max training with MMF training mm -hmm. with uh, rest pause training, and, and the volume of the rest pause exercise was considerably more obviously the load being used with the rest pauses mm -hmm. was also considerably more than the MMF set and yet MMF still seemed to shine through in, in that piece of research <clears throat> I think that yeah absolutely and and certainly the idea of training to MMF seems to be the key the key point the key stimulus to catalyze uh, chronic adaptation um, I think techniques such as rest pause um, lose practicality and you start to increase the inherent risk as well as time efficiency and resting between repetitions. They lose um, something in the science potentially because of the amount of rest that's given between repetitions. I was going to ask, do you, do you see a, a, a specific value to continuous tension? For me personally, I think that continuous tension is key. I think that that seems to be the, the, the most significant um, sort of variable within this context, within stimulating momentary muscular failure. As soon as you unload the muscle, whether that's because of an external force such as momentum or because you simply cease that repetition um, or cease exercise after that repetition, you allow the muscle to start to recover. And I know that people who advocate uh, multiple sets, you know, for strength training, advocate between two and five minutes rest mm. to allow ATP to fully replenish within, within the muscle. Um, but as soon as you're allowing that recovery, you're kind of you're you're just going over old ground when you're recruiting you're muscle fibers for a second steps. time. Yeah. If you just recruit as many muscle fibers as you can, surely it seems more logical, and it's the evidence seems to support that that's all that needs to be done. Um, in that sense, you might also consider the load being used. So if you use a very heavy load, then you can only make an inroad into your strength. Um, to your current strength level based on the load that you're using. If you use the far lighter load, then it might be that you can make a greater inroad because you can, you know, you can train to a point of failure. Your point of failure will be 
further in, you'll perform more repetitions over a longer time under tension. Now, this is something else really interesting that I've sparked in my mind from reading your research, um, is that this, this um, continuous tension um, and reaching momentary muscular failure seems to be the key, or potentially the key uh, parts of, of uh, productive resistance training. Um, and perhaps it's less important whether that point of MMF is achieved at say 60 seconds or much longer, whether it be two minutes or two and a half minutes. Is that kind of, have I appraised that correctly? Yeah, I think that, I mean, in, in the 2011 evidence-based resistance training recommendations paper, we talk about the idea of training to failure and the results seem to support the training to failure, no matter how many repetitions are performed in the process and how long there is muscular tension for seem to produce equivocal gains. Um, with that in mind, I would take a more pragmatic approach to how much time is available and how much, uh, what are the resources, sorry, are available. So for example, if you don't have resistance equipment, you might do more body weight exercises. And if you're particularly strong, those body weight exercises might take longer. There might be longer tension. Uh, a wall sit might be you know, over five minutes or a, a press up might be a higher number of repetitions or a slower repetition duration. Um, and therefore again, longer time of detention. But again, it doesn't seem to, I would take a more pragmatic approach to that. I think there's probably more significant factors than, than how long the muscle is under tension for. So there's no, there's probably no magic to, you know, traditional Nautilus of 50 to 70 seconds or, a time frame that's been used more recently, perhaps 60 to 90 seconds. We, we made a point of advocating around 60 to 90 seconds and 8 to 12 repetitions. Um, we only put a time frame, a, a caveat around 60 to 90 seconds with those repetitions to show that they were controlled repetitions where the muscle is kept under tension. Um, we only suggested that number of repetitions because we were at the time we were advocating a load that was also evidence-based to produce uh, increases in bone mineral density, which the evidence seems to support uh, around 80% of one repetition max. Um, I would very much like to review the literature and at some point plan to, to review the number of studies which have supported that and whether bone mineral density has been seen to improve, whether muscular tension uh, and, the, and the tenderness connection to the bone is sufficient stimulus to improve bone mineral density, even if there isn't the same force applied. So I think that there's other questions to answer there. Yeah, I think that would be such a valuable piece of research or to, to do to get the, get the information about because you know that's one of the things we hear about, you know, oh, you don't want the set to go too long because then you'll lose the efficacy for bone mineral density. Mm -hmm. um, so to find out, is that based on solid science? Because it must be between, you know, an 80% of one rep max yeah. would, would be practically exceptionally useful. Yeah, and I think that, that that's key for somebody like myself. With the research that I'm publishing, it's not just to answer questions, but it's also to ask more questions, to, to acquire the correct information to allow practitioners to be better advised with what they do with their clients. Great.